Well, good morning. Today we begin a brand new series called Choose Wisely. As you watch that opening video, I heard some gasps. It's people like that is not a very wise choice. Get off that rock face. Don't jump off that. Somebody's going to get hurt. Some of us remember, I remember when I was in my 20s, I was dumb enough to do that. When I was in my 30s, I wanted to do that. I've, I've, I've gotten some wisdom since then. What we're going to look at in this series, using the metaphor of hiking through the woods or rafting or kayaking down a river, what does it look like to make wise decisions and choose one path versus another? What is a matrix for making decisions that could help us as we begin to process the easy, the medium, but even the challenging questions we all face? So with that, I'd like you to join me as we take a hike together. As we take this hike together, I want you to reflect on the different choices, the paths you've taken, the paths maybe you haven't, where you've been in the, in the past, and where you might be in the future. Fresh air. I had almost forgotten what it feels like to breathe it in. I was beginning to wonder if I'd ever see the woods again. I've needed this and missed it. A chance to get alone with my thoughts, to sort stuff out. I remember the last time I was in these woods a few years ago. Sprained my ankle jogging on this very path. The sun was going down and I wasn't paying attention. Stepped on a big root, went down like a sack of potatoes. I'll never forget hobbling home in the dark. Two hours to go a mile. Yeah, I see the irony. A great metaphor for my life. Running fast in the dark, not paying attention, and any moment I could make a wrong step and then pain. Like that job I took right out of college. Good money, so I plunged right in. I didn't discuss it with anyone, didn't do any research, didn't even take time to think about whether I was right for the job or where it might lead. Mistake. Two years of pain and probably set my career back five. And then I did the same thing a few years later, leaving a stable job to jump ship for that startup. I thought that I'd thought it through, but again, I just plunged in. Didn't really talk it over with anyone. I told a lot of people about it, but didn't take any advice or listen to any warnings. But I guess that's been my pattern. Opportunities, react. Choices, react. Decisions, react. The rush of information is overwhelming, and in so many cases, the choices seem sensible, logical. It's hard to make the best choice. So I end up just grabbing at the one that's quickest, closest, easiest. So here I am again. A big job offer, and this one isn't just about me or my career. This one also affects Wendy and the kids. A little less money, but room to advance. A volatile industry. But enormous potential. Smart leadership, great benefits, fantastic stock options. But it means cutting ties at a firm I've been with for nearly a decade and moving, selling the house, changing schools. Go figure. There's thunder off in the distance. The wind is picking up, the path is getting rocky, and it's going to get dark soon. I think I'll head back home. I've got some decisions to make. This summer I had an opportunity to do a lot of hiking. I had an opportunity to do some whitewater rafting in Colorado, some kayaking down Little Miami, even some jet skiing up the Little Miami if you come from the Ohio side. One of the opportunities I had I really enjoyed was uh, while I was in Colorado, I got a chance to visit a place called Crystal Lakes. While we were there, uh, a friend said that we could stay there for the night, my wife and I, and he handed me a map. And this is like hundreds of thousands of acres. And he had two four-wheelers. And so we were going to be taking this four-wheelers up and down the trails and just having a great time. But it was like all dirt roads everywhere. Here's a view from Crystal Lake from one of the spots that we were at. He said, well, if you get lost, here's a map. He hands me this map. And I grab this thing and it's like, fold. I mean, this is like the original contractor who, who laid out these properties like 30 years ago. 
oh my goodness, it was overwhelming. He said, well, use this to make your way back home. What? Like, what number are you? Well, we're property number 654307QA. What? He said, well, if you get lost, and if you can't find your way back, every time you come to a crossroads, you'll see a sign for the names of the roads. And there's hundreds and hundreds of roads. He said, but you'll see a little blue strip on the side of the sign. I'm like, well, I wouldn't even notice that. He said, the little blue strip always shows you how to get back to the main office. So no matter where you are, no matter how complicated it becomes, no matter how lost you are, follow the blue strips which have an arrow, turn left or right at this crossroads. And that was so helpful because I I had some time, just hours, four-wheeling, praying, adventuring. And there are times I'm like, where in the world am I? And I followed those little blue markers back. I think for many times, especially if you're new to the Bible or not really thought the Bible is a relevant book, it feels like that map I had. Oh my goodness, there's uh, Old Testament and New Testament and Jesus and God and Judas. And uh... What I want to do in this series is what my friend did to me. To just show you some little simple questions, some markers on the sign paths that every time you come to a decision, we can reduce what seems like the complicatedness of the Bible into a place in which we can follow along. Because when it comes to decisions, the questions we ask determine the paths we take. And whether you're hiking in the mountains or whether you even kayak down low Miami, every time somebody's been there before, they will stack up little rocks to say, hey, this is the way, this is the path, I want to leave my mark. And I want to give you in the next three weeks questions to ask as you face different crossroads to process through your decision. Today we're going to address three of those questions, and my hope is that this will, one, help you avoid a lot of pain. Because there's nothing worse than repeating the same thing over and over again. And I've done it again and again. Secondly, what if we had a matrix? Like an actual manual matrix to look at to understand when I have a decision, what questions do I ask? Because it isn't every question you have. Sometimes it's not the questions I ask. It's the one I forget to ask that cause the problem. Hey, is this going to be good for my career? But I don't add the question, will this deepen my relationships long term? I said, well, am I making the same mistake over again? Or is this one of those questions I didn't really ask for input because I've got sort of a a self-made proverb in my head that says something like this. This is none of your business. We don't talk about financial things. I don't ask about the people I'm dating. I, I don't ask my parents' permission. I'm old enough now. Are there certain inputs that the reason we haven't learned from our past is because this is a none of your business category? Or are we asking questions like, is this sustainable long-term if I make this decision? So three questions we're going to look at today. And the first one is the pain test. The pain test. Have I learned from my past mistakes? Often when you're in a trail and you look back in your life, you'll, you'll recognize that certain times you stepped into the poison ivy in your career. At a certain point, you got off a certain path and you made a real damage in a girl you dated, a guy you dated, and everybody told you, don't, don't, is that right for you? Don't you see that? Oh, it's poison ivy all over you, and you, you didn't listen. Other times, you fall off a cliff financially because you really said, oh, this is a great thing, and I trust my wits, and oh, what happened here? Whether it's relationally, spiritually, financially, have we learned from our past mistakes? Because what we don't learn... We repeat. That's why oftentimes we look back at our life and our life rhymes. It's like, this is is where I was two years ago. This this is where we were in our marriage three years ago. This is where we were last week. What we don't learn, we repeat. And the book of Proverbs says that as a dog returns to his vomit, so a fool returns to his folly. And the problem is, it's just grotesque, emotional picture of, you've always seen your cat, right? You know, claw, claw, meow, claw, claw, choking on a furball. And you're like, get that thing out of there. Claw, claw, oh, finally. Oh, my goodness. You have friends over. It's just disgusting. You know, put the cat in the mudroom kind of thing. It gets gross. And then, worse, you see the cat spits up or the dog spits up. And then you're like, oh, no, don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. And the writer of Proverbs is saying, As disgusting as that is to see, when you repeat the same mistake over and over again, you're just like that dog eating his own vomit. 
You've got to relearn. You've got to learn this so you don't have to be retaught it over and over. So what I'd like you to do is I'd like to take you on a hike with me. I'd like you taking a hike in my neighborhood back behind my house. And as we go on this hike together, I'd like you to think about what are the mistakes that you wish you could redo? What are the moments you think to yourself, I never want to go back there again? So join me on a hike as we reflect on, have we really learned from our past mistakes? The consequence of a bad decision can be painful. Every time I'm uh, car loading my son and some of his friends, I start conversation off by saying, guys, it's time for Scar Wars. And I ask each one to tell me about some scar in their body and how they got it. I'm always amazed that suddenly the whole place becomes incredibly animated. One of the stories I tell is the story of how I got this uh, scar in my right hand. A piece of sheet metal went right through there. It's a constant reminder that my scars itch. It's a reminder that I didn't listen to somebody in authority over me when I should have. So my dad had just finished building a, uh, a big A-frame clubhouse. It was beautiful. And our old swing set was right next to it. He said, Chad, whatever you do, don't use that swing. I'm going to take it down in just a few moments. All I heard was, this is your last chance to use your swing. Sure enough, I got up in that swing. I'm going back and forth. And my hand was right at the level of that sheet metal had to be rushed to the emergency room. Every time I come to a decision, I see my right hand and I literally remember, don't forget to listen to people in authority who might have more experience than you do so you don't end up with another scar. Some paths are more treacherous than others. Hey, some you can twist an ankle, break a leg, or even get really hurt. This particular path, I've probably been down this thing, I don't know, hundreds of times. When we heard that we needed to hike 125 miles over 10 days in Israel, this is the one place closest to our house that we could get trained for it. I think the dumbest thing I ever did here was a buddy and I took both of our teenage boys four-wheeling down this pitch. And you know, when you're coming down here riding the brakes the whole time, you realize that some paths in life are more dangerous just because of the pitch. As you continue on the hike with me, there's a certain spot a little bit farther down, there's a particular tree that every time I hike past it, a flood of memories come in my way. This particular tree several years ago, we were four-wheeling past it, and there literally are scars on this tree from what happened. So you had to make a sharp turn to be able to get between this tree and that. And we were out with a couple of buddies and friends, and we were doing great. I left that day, and my son stayed out with the rest of the group. But he was a little bit more inexperienced at making those turns than I was. And instead of ricocheting right to go this direction between the trees, he hit the tree and instead the four-wheeler began to slide backwards. And about 24 inches on the other side of that tree, you couldn't see it from where you were, it was about a 20-foot drop cliff down to a creek. Whenever I hike back to that place, I'll come and sometimes even touch that tree. And I remember my son almost died here. My son was almost paralyzed here at this moment. When it comes to decisions, I didn't want my kids to make decisions out of fear. And I I have a need for adrenaline, I have a need for adventure, and and that's not going to go away. And I didn't want fear to control me or my kids' lives. But I also realize I have a tendency to go too fast. I have a tendency to run through things. And there are certain terrains, there are certain challenges that I've got to slow down, to go against my natural tendency. 
And so every time I go past it, I remind myself, this thing I'm thinking about, this thing I'm praying about, this thing I'm wondering about, is it one of those times, is it one of those moments that I want to be like the wise man? I want to learn from not only what did happen in the past, but also learn from what didn't happen in the past. That's why I think these these Proverbs are so helpful. As a dog returns to his vomit, so a fool repeats his folly. Another proverb says this, The wise man sees danger coming and hides himself. Oh, wow, let's not go there. Let's not go down that path. The fool keeps going despite warnings, despite what people have told him, despite his past, and suffers for it. I'm sure I'll be fine. I'm sure I'll be. It won't happen to me. Oh, don't be so sensitive. Ah, So third proverb says the same thing. Rebuke. Rebuke is more effective for a wise man than a hundred lashes to a fool. And when I'm foolish, it takes a hundred times before I realize how I'm handling my anger is not creating the marriage I want. But a wise man says, I'm going to let this one rebuke, this one moment, this one admonition, this one suggestion go deep into me and say, I've got to get this right. I've got to wrestle with this. Because I don't want the hundred lashes a fool takes to learn from his lesson. So first question, have I learned from my mistakes? To which you're saying, really? I showed up to church and all you have for me is did I learn from my mistakes? I think I could have come up with that on my own. Well, our second question is why we don't learn from our mistakes. We think we do. We tell ourselves we did, but we don't. It's because of the blind spot test. The blind spot test is we think we've learned the lesson. And the question we need to ask ourselves when we come to any decision is, have I sought wise and truthful input really? Really? Because the instinct is, of course I have. Really, have you asked for wise and truthful input and said, try and talk me out of this. Tell me why I'm wrong here. This last year I was uh, hiking uh, in the Everglades. We're down in Florida with another couple, a friend of ours, and he said, I would love to see the Everglades. And I said, well, I know exactly what the Everglades are. I've seen it on TV. There's alligators, there's crocodiles, there's lots of water, swamp. I'd love to see that. We got on a map, closest Everglades, here. We go to the Everglades, and it is barren. I mean, this is like the worst Everglades ever. We were hiking around there for about a half hour or so. Not one drop of water. That's not swampy. There's not even a puddle. Not even a puddle. I'm like, I thought I knew what Everglades were. This is the National Everglades. How can you have Everglades without water? There was no crocodiles. We're sort of looking around, driving around. And I would have said, hey, you've got to watch out when you're at the Everglades. I mean, I know about Everglades. I've seen it on TV. I watch TV. You've got to watch out for alligators. You've got to watch out for crocodiles. I don't know which one's which, but you've got to watch out. And suddenly we come across this sign that says, beware the panther. Panther? Panther? What are we doing out of the car? There's panthers around here? And if you'd ask me, like, what do you do when you encounter a panther? I'd say, I, I don't know. I, but, but probably, you know, I'd get one of those cheese ball signs that they put up that says, you know, don't feed them probably. And, and, and then, you know, uh, you'll run away if you see them. That's what I would have guessed the sign said. We wandered back to the main area, and we saw the panther warning sign. And here's what it said, despite what I thought. Number one, panthers are large, powerful cats. For safety's sake, when visiting, hike with a friend. That way you're both eaten. (laughs) If you should see a panther, number one, do not run. I would have said that's the first thing you do. Number two, Give the animal space to escape. Uh, Mr. Panther, feel free to use the door on the left, or feel free to use the door on the right. Or, here's my favorite one, look large. (laughs) Raise your arms and speak loudly. Mr. Panther, big man here, may not look real big, but uh, underneath all this, uh, I work out. Uh, Not really. Uh, um, Pick up small children. That's the fourth warning. Look, they just got eaten while I'm looking large, you know. They just got eaten if they crying out loud. And then lastly, in the unlikely event you are attacked, fight back. Like I'm in a boxing match. Oh, come on, come on, the panther here, right? I mean, I, had t- I would have told you what an Everglades was about. I would have told you what a warning on a panther is about. What, I'll tell you real good advice. 
if you're going to go with a friend, make sure you can run faster than them. So that was, I turned to my buddy, I said, you know, just know, you're a marathon guy, I'm a sprinter. You're going to outlast me, but he's going to eat you before he gets to me. So, blind spot. And what seemed what I understood about it was not what it really was. And often we come to decisions, we're weighing so much on our expertise, we don't realize we're blind to the real circumstances, the real definitions of the predators, and the real way in which we should approach such circumstances. And there's a couple of proverbs about this blind spot test. <laughs> Here's two of them. One says this. He who answers a matter before he hears it, it is folly and shame to him. You have a blind spot when, when somebody is talking, you answer them before you've really heard them. Now, many of us who are especially successful in our careers, we are very fast, sharp thinkers. And when somebody is talking to us about an issue or a problem, we are connecting the dots faster than they are bringing it out of their mouth. Which means we've actually already deduced, organized, solved, evaluated what they're saying, and and, and we're about to give our answer to the problem, and we haven't really listened. And what happens is it becomes folly to us. It's why we're not really good communicators in marriage. It's why our kids say you never listen very well. Is because we have a blind spot to our poor listening skills. We are answering an issue before we take time really understanding the emotions behind it, the fears behind it, the background behind it. We are blind because we answer too quickly and we listen so poorly. The second thing the proverb says here is there's a way that seems right, and that's why we're blinded by it. It seems right to run away from the panther. It seems right there should be water in the Everglades, for crying out loud. It seems right that i got to you know, really put my foot down here. It seems right that I shouldn't have any boundaries because you really love your kids. It seems right that I'm not going to get hurt. But in the way, in the end, it leads to destruction. And what this is saying is there are things that are going to end up in destruction. You're on a certain path financially, certain path spiritually, and it's going to end in a bad place. You keep thinking these thoughts, you're going to end up in a bad place. You keep allowing depression to take hold of you and not really get help, it's going to lead in a bad place. And it might seem right because it's a way to sort of get attention or, or it's a way to, 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 to get your needs met initially. But you're blind to the fact this has got some serious long-term consequences. And so the Bible warns us about the blind spots we have. Just because something seems right doesn't mean you've got it right. It's a great book I read years ago. It was called uh, Why Great Leaders Don't Take Yes for an Answer. And how we need to cultivate healthy conflict in our organizations, in our families, so that we make sure we're hearing people and hearing both sides of the equation. One of the stories to tell of Lee Iacocca. He had just taken over uh, with Ford, and he was actually reporting to Henry Ford II. And they just had this disastrous $250 million loss on the Edsel. did horribly. And so the whole company was sort of reacting from that loss. And part of the blind spot that created of the fear and the embarrassment and, and the, the pain of it was they said, no more new products. So they reacted from a new product that didn't do well to now they had a blind spot of even if there's a good product that comes along, let's not do that again. Well, Lee Iacocca felt very strongly that there was a marketplace for a four-seater sports car that he wanted to call the Mustang. But all of the executives, and certainly uh, Henry Ford II, said there is no chance we're introducing something that doesn't have a, 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 a previous run that's been working. He said, I really feel like if you'll let me do my homework, if you'll let me research this thing, there's a market for that. He gave him this minuscule budget. He did research to make sure he wasn't having a blind spot on his gut instinct. And the research came back, there really was a marketplace for what would eventually be known as the Ford Mustang. He convinced them to just give a little bit of budget, less than they'd ever had for any other car, and it became one of the most successful launches in history. And he helped his organization overcome the fear of failure. And often when you have a failure in the past, it so blinds you to trying anything new, because you're thinking, I, I, I got the first test down, I don't want to learn that again. But what you learned is don't try anything new, and that actually becomes your blind spot, fear. Same book tells the story of Colin Powell. When Colin Powell became Secretary of State, he realized one of the problems in the organization is by the time things get to you, it gets filtered. 
And that's why we have a blind spot. Sometimes the higher you get up the realm of success in your company, in your family, in your community, the higher you go up the mountain of success, the less and less people tell you the truth. Oh, boss, you're a great golfer. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You handled that meeting really well. The more successful you are, the more blinded you are to truth because people don't love you enough, people aren't courageous enough, and people aren't bold enough to tell you when you screw up. So you're blinded very much not by your weakness. You're blinded by your success and the environment it's created. And and Colin Powell realized this. So what he did is he began this really clever name. He called it The Phone. And he let people of all levels of the military access his central command from The Phone. He wanted to be able to know at all levels of organization how people felt about decisions, about direction, about morale. And that was a way in which he could get access to information, not be blinded by the generals reporting to him, telling him what they thought he wanted to hear, what, how they wanted to spin a certain particular issue or a particular um, investigative uh, you know, strategy they were putting together. And he said this. He said, the culture I wanted to create is I would turn to my generals and I would turn to my coworkers. I'd say this. I will stick by you when we have a fight. We can dig in. You dig in hard as to why you're right. I will dig in hard with a counter-argument. And I'll stick with you while we argue. I'll stick with you and say, let's really have healthy debate on this. And I'll stick with you when we fight. If you'll stick by me when we make a decision. And he created that culture of healthy conflict to make sure he was hearing the other side of the argument with the phone and that concept. See, there's things that seem right, but they blind us to hearing the truth. One of my favorite Proverbs is one that says, one side of an argument always seems right. Which is, I remember you're a kid, and if somebody hurts somebody, what do you want to do? You want to be the first one to tell mom and dad, right? You pushed your brother out of the way and ran, let me tell you what happened. And you painted this beautiful picture that had facts, and the facts were accurate. They just, all the facts you chose made you look good, and your sister looked like a scoundrel. Your brother looked like an idiot. And you keep, wow, I can't believe your brother. And what happens? It seemed right until the other side comes to question it. Well, this is so important when you hear gossip about a teacher, about a student, about a friend. When you hear one department complain about another department, and it, it's real, it's genuine, but you're only hearing one side of an argument. It seems right until the other side comes to question it or contend with it. The wisdom here is when I make decisions, I need to make sure I have all the facts, not just listen to the people I agree with, not just listen to the people who my, my, my intentions are in line with their intentions. How do I get all of that aligned? They did a psychological test. I'll give it it to you. So get ready. Uh, We're going to jump back into math class. Real easy math thing. See if you can answer this. A bat and a ball cost a dollar and ten cents. The bat costs a dollar more than the ball. How much does the ball cost? I went ten cents. It's easy. That's an easy math question. Ten cents. Ten cents plus a dollar is a dollar ten. And when they interviewed people at MIT and Harvard... The instinct of very, very smart people was to jump out and say 10 cents. And I did the same thing when I read it. None of you were bold enough to say it out loud. Let's do the math. So your instinct is to say 10 cents, but let's do the math. X plus X plus a dollar equals a dollar 10. Oh, it's a dollar more than the ball. A dollar 10 minus a dollar is 10 cents. 2X equals 10. X equals 5 cents. Oh, it's five cents because it's the ball plus a dollar five equals a dollar ten. And what they found is, didn't matter who they worked with, it was the success, it was the great instincts, it was the, 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 the professors, and it was the people who considered and were generally smart would short circuit the simple process of doing that algebraic equation because they trusted their instinct. And their success became their blind spot. And he said the same thing happens when we're in, in families, when we're in, when we're in business, when we're trying to get access to the truth. We, we fall prey to threat rigidity and cognitive rigidity. Threat rigidity is when you're under threat, there's pressure, we can't fail. There's pressure, we've got to have this account. There's pressure, we've got to get this right, this conversation with my son or daughter, or they may never speak to us again, or they may take the grandkids away from us. Under that level of threat, when the consequences are high, we get very blinded. 
The emotional part of our brain shuts off the cognitive part of our brain and we limit the sources of input that come our way. When you get hurt, you only hear people who say, no one should have to put up with what you did. You block out people who say, well, maybe you didn't handle this well. Well, you're on the the naughty list now. Threat rigidity actually creates blind spots. And cognitive rigidity is what happens when you're in a meeting and you say, all right, does anyone have anything that uh, they want to push back on this idea? And somebody says, I'm just not sure that uh, this can be done by November. And the leader of the meeting's like, really? And you read that nonverbal and go, I'm not giving any feedback. <laughs> because his nonverbals, he verbally said or she verbally said they want feedback, but the nonverbals say you don't give feedback here. And sometimes in a meeting, what you really want to attend, right, is the meeting after the meeting. What do you think of what happened today? I thought it was a stupid idea. So did I. Why didn't you speak up? Well, does anybody ever speak up with that guy? I sure don't know. That's a guy who's so-and-so lost a job, right? So the nature is though you think you're getting input, you're actually the cognitive rigidity of social norms. Hey, I can't say that in a meeting. You've got to encourage healthy feedback. You've got to praise healthy feedback. You've got to say, I want you to be opposition research. By next week, I want you to come back and convince this team why we shouldn't do it so we make sure we're not being blind. The pain test. Have I learned from the past? And have I not learned from the past because of blind spots? I don't even realize what it is I don't know. I don't even realize what it is I've missed out on. One of the things that calls blindness is, number one, we're overright. We're right often enough that we don't think we can be wrong. Our track record really is pretty good. Second, we're overconfident. And what happens is things that come easy to us don't come to easy to the people we lead. So we love change. I love change. I love adapting. And then I assume everybody in the organization loves adapting. And so we put a, uh, an implementation in place. And it's like, oh, my goodness. I'm thinking, we've been talking about this for six months. We're crying out loud. And they're like, I've just heard about this. Just heard about this. Like, and so sometimes the blindness is you don't have good change management because in your family, in your company, because you think other people like the same things you do and you're blind to change management. And sometimes you're right, you're overright. You're right just enough that you can't imagine you'd be wrong in something as simple as this. I remember my dad one time, we used to go uh, rafting all the time. So we love rafting. That's why I do a lot of rafting uh, down the Little Miami even now. We'd go rafting on the Mackinac River. And one day my dad uh, was on a trip and he told me, he, he parked his car, you know, about two miles down where they're going to get in. They drove the car here. They're hopping into their tubes. And a, a group of guys are floating by in their 20s. It's like, hey, guys, what's going on? Oh, we're just floating down the river. He's like, oh, where are you guys going to get out? They're serious. They said, oh, you know, we're just going to wait till it circles back around. My dad's like, should I tell him? (laughs) Rivers are not like the lazy river at at Kings Island. He didn't even tell him. He wasn't even worth it. So these are probably smart people in a lot of areas. But they didn't have experience in this area, and they really thought they were going to get back out at the same spot they got in. Which brings us to our third test, the homework test. Have I done the research, both on why I should do this and why I shouldn't do this? Have I really done the research? Now, these Proverbs are ones that go against my nature. Now, I love to think through decisions. I really do. But I also like to make decisions fast. And if a decision doesn't go right, I'll make an immediate another decision to course correct. And these Proverbs challenge me. Also, it is not good for a soul to be without knowledge. I don't want to be part of analysis paralysis. But in my aversion to that, I can sometimes jump in too quick. See, it's not good for your soul to be without knowledge when it comes to decisions. You haven't done your homework. But he who sins or misses the mark is what the word sin means is the person who hastens with their feet. They went in too fast. They rushed in and didn't do their homework. Another version of that. The plans of the diligent, the wise, when you're diligent about your decision-making, it leads uh, to plenty. It leads to benefits. It leads to good results. But those of everyone who's hasty, who rush in, surely lead to poverty. When you're hasty. Now this goes against. These are the Proverbs I don't memorize. These are the Proverbs like, well, that's probably for somebody. So I purposely memorize verses like this to keep my blind spots. Am I doing that thing where I'm being hasty? I might be. I had one a couple months ago. I was writing a rough draft for a blog. And I was in a particularly uh, 
goofy mood as I was writing on an airplane. So I was finishing this blog up, and I sent a copy of it. And uh, one of our staff members said, did you, can, can I read this to you? I said, well, sure. He said, uh, you said, and if you don't follow what I'm saying, you're pretty much a lemming. And I went, did I write that? And it was very offensive, which is not typical of me. And I realized that when I was saying lemming, I was remembering my favorite movie, Dead Poets Society. And I love that scene where, where Robin Williams takes everybody up on the, on the stool. You know, they all get up on top of the... Uh, on top of the uh, I'm fine, I'm fine. This is a wise decision. <laughs> he gets everybody up on top of the desk. And while they're up on the top of the desk, he says, now take a look at a different perspective. And most of the kids are just walking off and stepping off. He's like, don't be a lemming. Just just pause for a moment. So I use that phrase because in my past, that just had such a a, a wonderful connection to a movie I love. But when I read it, I went, did I write that? Man, I wrote that too fast. I'm so glad I got somebody to check this. Again, it was a rough draft. This is pretty offensive. Or sometimes we only look for data to confirm our biases. I was uh, listening to talk radio one day, and they had Governor Bevan on from Kentucky talking about job growth and some great things happening in Kentucky. And he says, well, let me tell you the secret to Kentucky. He said, the secret of what we got going on in Kentucky uh, comes down to what Abraham Lincoln said. Good things come to those who wait, but only what's left over from those who hustled. I went, great things come to those who wait, but only what's left over over by those who hustled. And I went, man, that is my motto for life. That's right. You can wait. You cannot be hasty. And you'll have what's left over from the rest of us who got it done. So I was telling a friend of mine, uh, Marcus here at church, we were having uh, lunch one day, and I said, man, I love this quote. It just so speaks to how I like to work, and it speaks to, uh, to, to go get them this. And he says, Chad, there is no way that Abraham Lincoln said that. I said, of course Abraham Lincoln said that. For one thing, Abraham Lincoln agrees with me, so I must be right. Two, the governor of Kentucky quoted it on national radio. It must be true. He's like, Chad, go, go do some homework. There is no way that Abraham Lincoln said that. And sure enough, Mental Floss did an article on the most ten misquoted verses or, or uh, quotes with Abraham Lincoln, and he never said this. The word hustle in Abraham Lincoln's day meant to hustle up a horse, to acquire something. It never meant to do something quickly. I still like the quote. It still speaks to one part of me that I think is pretty important. But that's my point. I go looking for quotes. On Facebook's the worst, right? You know, all politicians are a jerk. Put a picture of George Washington next to it. It's like, oh, wow, George said that. No. You know, people always post authorities. We go looking for evidence that creates our bias or reinforces our bias. It's this thing. I got to make sure I really did my homework here. And part of doing my homework is I've got to assume I'm blind, assume I'm biased, and assume I don't know what's going on. Jesus is so smart on this. And you might not believe Jesus died or rose from the grave. I do, and I think there's a lot of evidence to support it. And I think if you do your homework, um, there's a lot that really needs to be wrestled with. And I've read you know, competitive uh, or ideas or rebuttals to that. I've read Richard Dawkins and, and Christopher Hitchens. And, and I love reading people who disagree because I want to make sure that the conclusions I've come to are based on research, not just because I grew up as a Christian or grew up in a, in a religious household. But Jesus, I think when people make decisions, it's really weird, especially Christians who make really horrible decisions, and then they'll sort of blame God for it. You know, God told me to do this. <laughs> really? I told you to do it. Why was it that was so horrible? And I, Christians often engage in what I call magical thinking. They make very bad decisions, violating principles that he gives all through the Bible, and then they blame him for why this didn't work out. And, and people who make, aren't perp- you're not a person of faith, you're like, you know, I don't want to make decisions like that. It's like magical thinking. God's going to sort of bless my, my dumb decisions. And Jesus really affirmed this idea of doing your homework. He said, you need to consider the cost of building a tower. Consider the cost. You don't want to start building a tower and get two-thirds of the way done and you run out of money because you didn't do your homework on how much time it was going to cost and how long it was going to take. He gives another reference to war. He says a king, before he goes out to battle, the king first counts his troops, counts the troops of the opposing army, and he makes sure he has enough resources before he goes to battle. And if he doesn't, he tries to negotiate a treaty. It is very, very spiritual and very, very smart and very, very wise and certainly validated by the Bible to think through our decisions on multiple levels. Because the questions we ask determine the paths we take. And so what we're giving you today in this series is a bookmark, which I realize this seems ancient, like bookmarks. But I want to give you those tests. So as you come face to face, we're going to cover the rest of these in the next couple weeks. 
And when you come face to face with a question, a decision, you can begin to roll through these particular questions. Have I done the homework? In light of my priorities, we'll talk about in two weeks. Really use this as a matrix for your decisions. But here's what I'd like you to think about. When you come face to face with decisions, you've got to stand up for the truth. Because the brain lies to itself. And there's psychological research to validate this. There's sociological evidence to validate this. When your emotions, your heart has decided it wants something, it filters out any data that says you shouldn't, and it goes and finds data that will reinforce it. So the only wise thing to do, at least for me, the only wise thing to do is to stand up for truth in your decisions. Why do you do that? The only way I have found to stand up for truth is I've got to come to a decision and assume I'm blind. Because I always assume I'm not. I've got to assume I've got blind spots. And I've got to say to myself, if I was blind in this moment, if I was blind to the, the facts, how would I operate differently if I was blind? What questions would I ask? Who would I talk to if I was truly blind here? Two, I've got to assume I am biased. That I'm trying to get data to validate what I've already decided. I've got to assume I'm biased and I've got to assign people in meetings. Your job is opposition research. You've got to come back to the meeting next week and tell us why we're, we're all made a bad decision. Now, we may or may not go that direction, but we've got to make sure that we haven't been biased in this. Three, I've got to assume I'm brash. I've got to assume that I'm going too fast. And I think about stuff all the time. My brain never turns off. So by the time I make a decision, I have thought about it for weeks, months, years sometimes. But when I go to implement, I still have to say to myself, my tendency is toward action, not reflection. If I was assuming I was brash, who else would I talk to? If I'm assuming I'm brash, what would it look like to do a little more homework here? Three tests. A matrix for decision making so we can learn from the pain of the past protect ourselves from the blind spots we all have, and make sure we've really done the homework we need for these decisions. You know, R.E.M. had this uh, hit song. And part of the song started with a guitar player who got this little rift on his guitar, and the other band members didn't like it. They're like, that is never going to be liked. No one's ever going to like that song. It's just too simple. And they said, he said, well, go for it. I got an instinct here. And they said, all right, we'll tell you what. We'll write lyrics as simple as the guitar rift. And it was about needing an anchoring point with decisions. When you're not sure where to go, when everything in the world seems uh, changing, which it seems today, and there's nothing you can anchor into, when you're about to make a decision, stand for a moment. Find a fixed point to reference how you're going to think through the process. Make the sun that reference point. Make the mountain the reference point. And God's saying, whatever decision is in front of you today, I want to be your reference point, that you can stand for truth and use me as an anchoring point. And if you're not sure where you believe about Jesus, God, or the Bible, it is a time-trusted book of truth that can be a reference point when you're standing in the middle of a very difficult crossroads. So stand for truth. Jesus said only the truth can set you free. Next time you're in a fight and your instinct is to be all defensive and, oh, they they shouldn't talk to me that way, stand for truth. I'm assuming I'm handling this poorly. I'm assuming I'm not a good listener. I'm going to assume I'm being defensive. How would a person who's defensive and angry who wants to change this pattern in my relationships stand for truth? because only the truth will set you free. And we'll be digging more into that in the next couple weeks. Thanks for being here. Stand for truth as you go into the week. Thanks again.